Leopold Louis Philippe Mary Victor II was the second king of the Belgians from 1865 to 1909 and the self-made autocratic ruler of the Congo Free State from 1885 to 1908. Leopold's administration of the Congo Free State was characterized by atrocities and systemic brutality including forced labor, torture, murder, kidnapping, and the amputation of the hands of men, women, and children when the quota of rubber was not met. Welcome to History's Biggest Villains. Leopold was born in Brussels on April 9, 1835, the second child of the reigning Belgian monarch Leopold I and of his second wife Louise, the daughter of King Louis-Philippe of France. The French Revolution of 1848 forced his maternal grandmother Louis-Philippe to flee to the United Kingdom. Louis-Philippe died two years later. In 1850. Leopold's mother was deeply affected by the death of her father and her health deteriorated and she died of tuberculosis the same year when Leopold was 15 years old. His sister Charlotte became Empress Carlota of Mexico in the 1860s. The British monarch at the time, Queen Victoria, was Leopold II's first cousin since Leopold's father and Victoria's mother were brother and sister. At the age of 18, Leopold married Mary Henriette of Austria, a cousin of Emperor Franz Joseph of Austria and the granddaughter to the late Holy Roman Emperor Leopold II on August 22, 1853 in Brussels. Lively and energetic, Mary Henriette endeared herself to the people by her character and her benevolence. Her beauty earned her the title the Rose of Brabant. She was also an accomplished artist and musician. She was passionate about horseback riding to the point that she would care for her horses personally. Some joked about this marriage of a stableman and a nun, the latter referring to the shy and withdrawn Leopold. The marriage produced four children, three daughters and one son, Prince Leopold, Duke of Brabant, although he died at the age of nine from pneumonia after falling into a pond. His death was the source of great sorrow for King Leopold. The marriage became unhappy and the couple separated after a last attempt to have another son, a union that resulted in the birth of their last daughter Clementine. Mary Henriette retreated to Spa in 1895 and died there in 1902. Leopold had many mistresses. In 1899, 65-year-old Leopold took Caroline Lacroix, a 16-year-old French prostitute, as his mistress and they remained together until his death in the next decade. Leopold lavished upon her large sums of money, estates, gifts, and a noble title, Baroness de Vaughan. Owing to these gifts and the unofficial nature of their relationship, Caroline became deeply unpopular among the Belgian people and internationally. They married secretly in a religious ceremony five days before his death. Their failure to perform a civil ceremony rendered the marriage invalid under Belgian law. After two marriages, Leopold still continued to seek many mistresses from various brothels. After the king's death, it soon emerged that he had left Caroline a large fortune which the Belgian government and Leopold's three estranged daughters tried to seize as rightfully theirs. Caroline bore two sons, probably fathered by Leopold. Leopold's older brother, the earlier crown prince Louis Philippe had died the year before he was born, making him the heir to the throne. When he was nine years old, he received the title of the Duke of Brabant and was appointed a sub-lieutenant in the army. He served in the army until his accession in 1865, by which time he had reached the rank of lieutenant general. Leopold's public career began in 1855 when he became a member of the Belgian Senate. He took an active interest in the Senate, especially in matters concerning the development of Belgium and its trade, and began to urge Belgium's acquisition of colonies. Leopold traveled abroad extensively from 1854 to 1865, visiting India, China, Egypt, and the countries on the Mediterranean coast of Africa. His father died on December 10th, 1865, and Leopold took the oath office on December 17th at the age of 30. Leopold became king in 1865. He explained his goal for his reign in an 1888 letter addressed to his brother, Prince Philippe, Court of Flanders, saying, The country must be strong, prosperous, therefore have colonies of our own, beautiful and calm. His reign was marked by a number of major political developments. The liberals governed Belgium from 1857 to 1880 and during its final year in power legislated the Frey Orban Law of 1879. This law created free, secular, compulsory primary schools supported by the state and withdrew all state support from Roman Catholic primary schools. The Catholic Party obtained a parliamentary majority in 1880 and four years later, 
restored state support to Catholic schools. In 1885, various socialist and social democratic groups drew together and formed the Labor Party. Increasing social unrest and the rise of the Labor Party forced the adoption of universal male suffrage in 1893. Other social changes were enacted into law during this time. Among these were the right for workers to form labor unions and the abolition of the Livre Dovier, an employment record book. Laws against child labor were passed. Children younger than 12 were not allowed to work in factories. Children younger than 16 were not allowed to work at night. And women younger than 21 years old were not allowed to work underground. Workers gained the right to be compensated for workplace accidents and were given Sundays off. The first revision of the Belgian constitution came in 1893. Universal male suffrage was introduced, though the effect of this was tempered by plural voting. The eligibility requirements for the Senate were reduced and elections would be based on a system of proportional representation which continues to this day. Leopold pushed strongly to enable a royal referendum whereby the king would have the power to consult the electorate directly on an issue and use his veto according to the results of the referendum. The proposal was obviously rejected as it would have given the king the power to override the elected government. Leopold was so disappointed that he considered abdication. Leopold emphasized military defense as a basis of neutrality and strove to make Belgium less vulnerable militarily. He achieved the construction of defensive fortresses at Liège, at Namur, and Antwerp. During the Franco-Prussian War, he managed to preserve Belgium's neutrality in a period of unusual difficulty and danger. He pushed for a reform in military service, but he was unable to obtain one until he was on his deathbed. The Belgian army was a combination of volunteers and lottery and it was possible for men to pay for substitutes for service. This was replaced by a system in which one son in every family would have to serve in the military. Leopold commissioned a great number of buildings, urban projects, and public works, largely with the profits generated from exploitation of the Congo Free State. These projects earned him the title of Builder King. In addition to his public works, Leopold acquired and built numerous private properties for himself inside and outside Belgium. He expanded the grounds of the Royal Castle of Laken and built the Royal Greenhouses, as well as the Japanese Tower and the Chinese Pavilion near the palace, now called the Museums of the Far East. In the Ardennes, his domain consisted of 17,000 acres of forest and agricultural lands in the Chateau of Ardennes, Cernon, Fenif, Valer Soles and Farage. He also built important country estates on the French Riviera, including the Villa de Cedres and his botanical garden and the Villa Leopolda. Thinking of the future after his death, Leopold didn't want the collection of estates, lands, and heritage buildings he had privately amassed to be scattered amongst his daughters each of whom was married to a foreign prince. In 1900, he created the Royal Trust, by means of which he donated most of his property to the Belgian nation in perpetuity and arranged for the royal family to continue using them after his death. On November 15, 1902, Italian anarchist Gennaro Rubino attempted to assassinate Leopold, who was riding in a royal cortege from a ceremony in memory of his recently deceased wife, Mary Henriette. After Leopold's carriage passed, Rubino fired three shots at the procession. The shots missed Leopold, but almost killed the king's grand marshal, John de Outremont. Rubino was immediately arrested and subsequently sentenced to life imprisonment. He died in prison in 1918. The king replied after the attack to a senator, My dear senator, if fate wants me shot, too bad. After the failed regicide, the king's security was questioned because the glass of his carriage was two centimeters thick. Elsewhere in Europe, the news of this assassination attempt was received with alarm. Heads of state and the pope sent telegrams to the king congratulating him for surviving the assassination attempt. The Belgians rejoiced that the king was safe. Leopold fervently believed that overseas colonies were the key to a country's success, and he worked tirelessly to acquire colonial territory for Belgium. He envisioned our little Belgium as the capital of a large overseas empire. Leopold eventually began to acquire a colony as a private citizen. The Belgian government lent him money for this venture. During his reign, Leopold saw the empires of the Netherlands, Portugal, and Spain as being in a state of decline and expressed interest in buying their territories. In 1866, Leopold instructed the Belgian ambassador in Madrid to speak with Queen Isabella II of Spain about ceding the Philippines to Belgium. Knowing the situation fully, the ambassador did nothing. Leopold quickly replaced the ambassador with a more sympathetic individual to carry out his plan. In 1868, when Isabella II was deposed as the Queen of Spain, Leopold tried to press his original plan to acquire the Philippines, but without funds, he was unsuccessful. Leopold then devised another unsuccessful plan to establish the Philippines as an independent state. When both of these plans failed, Leopold shifted his aspirations of colonization to Africa. 
After numerous unsuccessful schemes to acquire colonies in Africa and Asia, in 1876, Leopold organized a private holding company disguised as an International Scientific and Philanthropic Association, which he called the International African Society, or the International Association for the Exploration and Civilization of the Congo. In 1878, under the auspices of the holding company, he hired Henry Stanley to explore and establish a colony in the Congo region. Much diplomatic maneuvering among European nations resulted in the Berlin Conference of 1884 to 1885 regarding African affairs, at which representatives of 14 European countries and the United States recognized Leopold as sovereign of most of the area to which he and Stanley had laid claim. The colonial nations of Europe authorized his claim by committing the Congo Free State to an improving the lives of the people. On February 5th, 1885, the Congan Free State, an area 76 times larger than Belgium, was established under Leopold II's personal rule and private army, the Force Publique. In 1894, King Leopold signed a treaty with Great Britain which conceded a strip of land on the Congo Free State's eastern border in exchange for the Lado Enclave, which provided access to the navigable Nile and extended the Free State's sphere of influence northwards into Sudan. After rubber profits soared in 1895, Leopold ordered the organization of an expedition into the Lado Enclave, which had been overrun by modest rebels since the outbreak of the Modest War in 1881. The expedition was composed of two columns. The first, under Belgian Baron Danis, consisted of a sizable force numbering around 3,000 and was to strike north through the jungle and attack the rebels at their base in Rajiv. The second, a much smaller force of 800, was led by Louis Napoleon Chatlin and took the main road towards Regif. Both expeditions set out in December 1896. Although Leopold had initially planned for the expedition to carry on much farther than the Lotto Enclave, hoping indeed to take Fashoda and then Khartoum, Danis's column mutinied in February 1897, resulting in the death of several Belgian officers and the loss of his entire force. Nonetheless, Chatlin continued his advance and on February 17, 1897, his outnumbered Numbered forces defeated the rebels in the Battle of Rijif, securing the Lotto Enclave as a Belgian territory until Leopold's death in 1909. Leopold amassed a huge personal fortune by exploiting the natural resources of the Congo. At first, ivory was exported, but this didn't generate the expected levels of revenue. When the global demand for rubber exploded, Attention shifted to the labor-intensive collection of sap from rubber plants. Abandoning the promises of the Berlin Conference in the late 1890s, the free state government restricted foreign access abuses, especially in the rubber industry, included forced labor of the native population, beatings, widespread killings, and frequent mutilation when production quotas were not met. Failure to meet rubber collection quotas was punishable by death. Meanwhile, the forced public were required to provide the hand of their victims as proof when they had shot and killed someone, as it was believed that they would otherwise use the munitions for hunting. As a consequence, the rubber quotas were paid off in chopped hands. Missionary John Harris of Boringa was so shocked by what he had encountered that he wrote to Leopold's chief agent in the Congo saying, I have just returned from a journey inland to the village of Isango Mbayo. The abject misery and utter abandon is positively indescribable. I am so moved, Your Excellency by the people's stories that I took the liberty of promising them that in the future you would only kill them for crimes they commit. Estimates of the death toll range from 1 million to 15 million since accurate records weren't kept. Adam Hotschild devotes a chapter of his 1998 book King Leopold's Ghost to the problem of estimating the death toll. He cites several recent lines of investigation by an anthropologist Jan Vecina and others that examine local sources which include police records, religious records, oral traditions, genealogies, personal diaries, and many other things which generally agree with the assessment of the 1919 Belgian government commission. Roughly half the population perished during the free state period. Smallpox epidemics and sleeping sickness also devastated the disrupted population. By 1896, African trip penicillin had killed up to 5,000 Africans in the village of Lokuela on the Congo River. The mortality statistics were collected through the efforts of British Consul Roger Casement, who found, for example, only 600 survivors of the disease in 1903. International opposition and criticism at home 
from the Catholic Party, progressive liberals, and the Labour Party caused the Belgian Parliament to compel the King to cede the Congo Free State to Belgium in 1908. The deal that led to the handover cost Belgium the considerable sum of 215.5 million francs. This was used to discharge the debt of the Congo Free State and to pay out its bondholders as well as 45.5 million to Leopold's pet building projects in Belgium and a personal payment of 50 million to him. Leopold went to great lengths to conceal potential evidence of wrongdoing during his time as ruler of this private colony. The entire archive of the Congo Free State was burned and he told his aide that even though the Congo had been taken from him, they have no right to know what I did there. The Congo was given independence in 1960. In December 17, 1909, Leopold died at Laken and the Belgian crown passed to Albert I, the son of Leopold's brother Philippe. His funeral cortege was booed by the crowd in the expression of disapproval of his rule of the Congo. Leopold's reign was exactly 44 years and it remains the longest in Belgian history. Attention to the Congo atrocities subsided in the years after Leopold's death. Statues of him were erected in the 1930s at the initiative of Albert while the Belgian government celebrated his accomplishments in Belgium. The debate over Leopold's legacy was reignited in 1999 with the publication of King Leopold's Ghost by the American historian Adam Hochschild. In 2010, Louis Michel a Belgian member of the European Parliament and former Belgian foreign minister called Leopold a visionary hero. According to Mikkel, to use the word genocide in relation to the Congo was absolutely unacceptable and inappropriate. Maybe colonization was domineering and acquiring more power, but at a certain moment it brought civilization. Mikkel's remarks were countered by several Belgian politicians. Senator Paul Van Den Dreisch replied, a great visionary? Absolutely not. What happened then was shameful. If we measured him against 21st century standards, it is likely that Leopold would have been hauled before the International Criminal Court in The Hague. In June 2020, a Black Lives Matter demonstration in Brussels protested the murder of George Floyd, causing Leopold's legacy to come up once again in the subject of debate. MPs agreed to set up a parliamentary commission to examine Belgium's colonial past, a step likened to the Truth and Reconciliation Committee set up in South Africa after the apartheid regime was abolished. On June 30th, the 60th anniversary of the Congo's independence, King Philippe released a statement expressing his deepest regret for the wounds of the colonial past in the acts of violence and cruelty committed, but did not explicitly mention Leopold's role in the atrocities. Some activists accuse him of not making a full apology. Leopold remains a controversial figure in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. In the capital Kinshasa, known until 1966 as Leopoldville in his honor, his statue was removed after independence. Congolese culture minister Christopher Mazungu decided to reinstate the statue in 2005. He noted that the beginning of the Free State had been a time of some economic and social progress. He argued that people should recognize some positive aspects of the king as well as the negative. But hours after the 20-foot statue was installed near Kinshasa's central station, it was officially removed. Several statues have been erected to honor the legacy of Leopold II in Belgium. The monuments were supposed to help get rid of the scandal after international commotion about the atrocities of the Congo during Leopold's rule and to raise people's enthusiasm for the colonial enterprise in Belgian Congo. Leopold's controversial regime in the Congo Free State has motivated proposals for these statues to be removed. During the international George Floyd protests against racism in May to July of 2020, several statues of Leopold II were vandalized and petitions calling for the removal of some or all the statues were signed by tens and thousands of Belgians. In early June 2020, a majority in the Brussels Parliament requested a committee to be set up to decolonize the public sphere. From June 9, 2020 onwards, Authorities in Belgium gave way to public pressure and began removing some of the statues in Leopold. And I say, good for him. I don't know how you can sit there and say a guy who exploited your country for rubber and natural resources led to economic growth. The economic growth was obviously not to benefit you, bruh. The fact that he tried to be shady and he knew what he was doing was wrong, which is why he came to the to all the Berlin conference with, with, with a fake, with a shell company. He had a shell company to hide what he was doing because he knew it was wrong. But he wanted to control, he wanted to be power, he wanted to have power, he was a power hungry person. If, he, if you think what he did was positive, take a look at all the pictures of those Congoans with chopped off hands and amputated limbs because they didn't get enough rubber out of the trees. Right, th that was very positive, come on man. But I thank you for watching this, I hope you enjoyed this. Um, leave a like, um, hit that 
notification bell, hit that subscribe button. I'm out. Peace.